All right, Boz, we're going to have ourselves a little fire round today. Yes, sir. Those are my favorite. Just I do. right from the fire hose. Yeah. Not a lot of prep. Let's I go. I enjoy these. So <laughs> Me too. I went through the past few episodes of very not random comments that were left on BTWB and uh, again, recent episodes, and I pulled out four or five various questions that I don't think any particular one is a full show, but each one can we can have a nice little chat and, and cover some decent ground. So that's the format we're going with. I dig it. All right, let's see. All right, let's just start with this one. This one is from Scott F. It says, general question, the training versus testing discussion is very helpful for me as both an athlete and a coach every time that it comes up. I notice the more my mindset shifts towards building fitness, building a fitness wall, the less I focus on any given brick in that wall and my journey feels better. That's very cool, by the way. That said, I want to keep an eye on long-term trends, track my performance and benchmarks, et cetera, et cetera. How would you two approach benchmarks from the perspective of an, of an everyday, non-competitive garage gym athlete? I've attended gyms that have periodic benchmark weeks and gyms that just sprinkle them in throughout the year without a lot of fanfare. How would you two implement this? That's a fun question. I like it that is. a lot. Yeah, and too. I, I would say that either of those choices, if those are the ones that you're going to be kind of using categorically right off the bat mm -hmm. are great choices. I don't think there's anything wrong with like, hey, end of summer, I'm going to hit like these five to 10 benchmarks and I'm kind of seeing it coming. Great. Uh, I also don't think there's any problem with interspersing them a little bit more, um, not randomly, but, but more periodically with more space. I think that's fine too. I think what you've got to be careful of in both instances is that you don't fall into the trap of starting to train specifically for what you think is going to be happening. Right, sure. Um, and, you know, that's okay once in a while for certain things like, hey, I really have a goal to get a uh, you know, sub seven minute 2K or whatever, fine. A little bit of focus training isn't a big deal. Um, but it does kind of undermine the whole point if you're saying, all right, I'm going to do Fran. I'm going to do it at the end of the summer. From here until then, it's going to be thrusters and pull-ups all day. Uh, number one, you're going to drive yourself insane. <laughs> and number two, <laughs> number two, you're not really accurately depicting your level of fitness at that point. You're, you're starting to look at your level of specific preparation for that thing. And those are different. So yep. I, I like both of those. And to me, it's more of a personality uh, choice. What, what, what is going to feel better to you, the individual? Do you like that kind of uh, known entity of the week? Great. If that's what fires you up, go for it. Um, me personally, I like the interspersing periodically. Uh, benchmarks are stressful enough. Having to do a whole week of them seems like a, a pretty rough ticket to me psychologically, but that's just my opinion and my personal uh, take on that. So, but I don't think you could go wrong. Yes, and I was I was going to ask you that because again, it might be uh, an area of divergence for us. But you know, yeah. I think once again we find ourselves in agreement. I <laughs> what you said, true and accurate. And I'll just say, you know, I won't be wishy washy. Categorically, I don't like benchmark week. I don't like it. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I just why not? What's I'm well, again, if, if if let's just say it's five workouts in one week. That's way too much stress for one particular week. And then mm -hmm. what does that mean to the average gym goer that maybe hasn't fully evolved their sense of what's that their workout performance is unrelated to their value as a human being and you can have a bad workout and how did you sleep last week and your hamstrings from Monday might affect what's going on on Thursday. And so you've got five benchmarks that you know have been coming up for several months and they're one right after another, after another, after another. Do you have to PR all five in that week? Holy cow! I mean, what if you what what if you do three out of five? Is that a still? Did you pass your benchmark week? Or are you unhappy because that's a sixty yeah. percent? Is it four Capital out of five? Capital fail. Right. You're like what is this? <laughs> like every single day another test. Tuesday a test. Wednesday a test. Thursday a test. Again, to each their own. But for me personally, I would be like, mm, I don't I don't like that week. For me, I would much rather have them sprinkled in periodically, quite frankly, as I actually like Scott's uh, phrasing there, without a lot of fanfare. You know, if yeah. every if I haven't yep. done the chief in three months, and the chief fits Ooh, into what I'm supposed best. to do this week, 
I knew that you'd like the chief. That's why I brought it up. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately got you on my side when I said the chief. So good. You know, <laughs> you know if I haven't done the chief in, in three months and it fits on what I'm supposed to do on Wednesday, well, that's nestled in. That's a repeat this week. Great. Oh, and by the way, I've done the chief for three months. That's a nice period of time for me to get some adaptations. Not like I did it two weeks ago or something like that. So I'm personally a fan of the of the sprinkling in. And, and I I bet every week that I program has at least one workout that we've done before. Like there's at least one sure. compare to. I would I would argue that there's at least two, to be honest with you. Now, one might be a heavy day, could be a five by five back squat or something sure. like that. One could be a mixed modality. But I would bet on the average, there's at least two that pop up that we've done before. And every now and then there could be a three in a week, you know, but that would that wouldn't be that I intentionally wanted to put three repeats in that week. It just so happened that some workouts that we have done before fit really well with what happened this mm -hmm. week, you know. So again, that's just teach their own, but that's I like the sprinkle. I like the sprinkle. That's personally. a lot of regularity that once a week is uh, that's good. That's honestly making me evaluate where my training is right now, which admittedly is not super consistent you know uh anyway that that's neither here nor there but what what i am kind of looking at right now uh off the cuff in my own training is that certainly is high as far as the frequency of repeats that i've been uh exposing myself to recently so mm -hmm. that to me is like oh yeah i should bump that up just from this conversation and i will say for me personally just because a repeat happens to appear on a particular week. Now, this has taken me like 16 years to actually come to this place of like, <laughs> of, yeah. of inner peace. Uh, but I, I won't feel an undue pressure to beat a previous time if I'm not feeling sure. it on that day. Sleep yep. was broken, whatever it happened to be, then I don't care that it's my 11th time doing Helen. Now, if I woke up feeling yeah. like I could just tear the head off of a lion, well, you know, we're going to try to get after Let's it. Let's go you know? for so, it. Yeah, yeah. So that's... Well, and I'll say that. one more thing about that too, and this is true for not just bench, benchmark workouts in CrossFit, but really any athletic performance. The more exposure that you've got, the less frequency between that test uh, should you see. And so, for example, if you're somebody who's new and the first time you do Fran and a retest, I mean, that could be a matter of weeks and you're mm -hmm. gonna see some pretty significant progress. Right. You have somebody who's 10 years deep that progress is not going to be um, happening at the same scale anymore. It's going to be very incremental. It's going to be slow. You've already done a lot of adapting. And so if you are, again, having that really narrow window between when you see something and when you see it again, it's just going to be a recipe for frustration mm -hmm. because it takes longer with your training age to see that result uh, in actuality. So, and, and that's true for anything. You look at you know, really advanced lifters they're going to train a whole cycle, meaning like an Olympic cycle, a four-year cycle, and they're going to add, what, five kilos to their total, something like that, 10 kilos, which is crazy, mm -hmm. right? That, that's a lot, lot of lifts for a very small incremental progress yeah. at that point because they've already gotten all the cheap and easy gains. And you're at the top and of the so, mountain already. There's not, there's not exactly. much uh, gain left. Yep. And you see that across the board with, with most uh, sport application. You know, Usain Bolt is not going to run the 100 meter dash every Friday and expect that it's going to be ballpark of his best ever. It's just that's right. a crazy expectation that you should not put on yourself as a CrossFit athlete either. So, amen to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next one. This is from T. Nielsen. Long story short. Uh, he has been doing, well, I don't know if he, T, T Nielsen. They've been doing CrossFit for 12 years now. Right previous, on. Pre, yeah, no kidding. Previous gym, victim of COVID-19, built up a nice garage gym, was hitting some good stuff, enjoyed some good programming for a while, recently made their way back into a local affiliate. And uh, one thing that I have noticed and wonder how to broach is the subject with the coach that basically more coaching and less programming would be good. Between a strength mm. portion and a Metcon every day, there does not seem to be enough time to actually coach proper technique. How do I broach this with the owner without seeming like the quote-unquote new guy who knows it all? 
Oof, that's a, that's a tight rope. The watch, human right? psychology <laughs> question. <laughs> oh man, the human condition. Just own it. Go in guns blazing and <laughs> just tell people why they're wrong. Yeah, that's I couldn't help but notice the start. 5 p.m. class sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, of course, that's probably not the best way to approach this. Um, right. I think uh, like it's okay to be real with people, though, uh, in a non-confrontational way. It's just like, hey, I don't feel like I had enough time to really get warmed up for this. Or, hey, I don't feel like I had enough time to really refine this skill. And just put it out there. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to have a solution at the ready that you're like, wow, it's just waiting for you to ask. And here's mm -hmm. what I would do if I were in your shoes, because now you're going to start to get into some weird defensive territory, but I think expressing your legitimate experience to the coach is something that they should want to know about. And um, obviously the devil's in the details there and your delivery has got to be uh, oh, yeah. done well. But if it's genuine and if it's real and uh, you know that's something that they will benefit from, even if they don't even if they're a little dismissive up front, you know, sometimes people are going to take something like that and be like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. Cool story, bro. But then at least it's in there. You planted the seed. And when they are away from the immediacy of your concern, away from the immediacy of the next class rolling in behind and you got to get going again, and they're thinking about what is going to happen next week and next session, whatever, now at least they've got that to consider. So... I think it's about managing your own expectation of when that change is going to happen and what your response is going to be, and then approaching it in a way, like I said, that is, hey, this is a genuine reflection of my experience. I didn't feel like I had enough time to do this, and I need more time to be better at this. And that's it. And, well, I, I'm a big believer that you can say, I guess I'll say almost, you can say almost anything to anyone <laughs> if you are very, if you're a very skilled orator, you know, but you got to choose yeah. your words carefully. A and, diplomat of sorts. Yeah. And not necessarily disarm the subject that you're talking to. But, sure. you know, if you come in guns blazing, like you said, it's, you know, this is this person's gym culture, like they're they're yeah. going to be protective of it. So they might be a bit defensive. So if you come in with something along the lines of, but also because of those things, you would think the gym owner very much wants it to be awesome. Yes. And so absolutely. Yeah. If you're like, look, I, you know, I love being here, as you know, worked out for a couple of years by myself. It's so nice to just to be in this environment, but you know, it's just a couple of nice things like, but Hey, the, you know, I, I came here and I'm no longer working out on my own because I, I sought out coaching. You know, this is, this really why I'm here. I could go to your website and do the workouts on my own if I wanted to sure. in my garage. So yep. I'm here for the interaction that I would like to get from your coaches. And I'd have to be honest with you, I've, I feel like it's fallen a bit short or it hasn't, you know, met my expectations. And then maybe you could have a, a conversation as to what were your expectations? Are they realistic? And either maybe mm -hmm. you had, maybe what you were envisioning was a one-on-one -on -one training session. And, you know, but most likely was the case is ideally you'd have a little bit of an eye-open experience with that coach or trainer as to, well, why do you feel that way? And if you have just you know, a couple of just nicely presented, well, this, that, or the other things, I would hope that they would be, even if in the back of their mind, it stings a little bit because, you know, it, it's your human being, that, that desire to be like, well, I don't want any client coming up to me and saying that they don't feel like they're getting what ideally, you know, we are a coaching business here. And so I would, I would think leading off with something nice, how much you've enjoyed being in there and then why you came there in the first place, which was coaching and why you feel like, mm, I got to go ahead and broach this. I would hope that would be warmly received. And here's the other part, which will be interesting. Making the assumption that T. Nielsen does present it in a good manner. Yeah. If the conversation doesn't go well, then you have just learned a lot about that owner and that environment. Sure. You know, if you come off, you know, just Johnny aggressive, you know, talks about, yeah, that's not going to go well. But if you really did, you know, you really did a nice presentation and they just kind of like, new guy, quiet, you know, like, ooh, that to me would be like, maybe you ought to take your business down the street. You know, so I think even just having yeah, that conversation will be very illuminating with how it goes. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. Um, and, you know, this is for all the, trainers out there and the coaches and affiliate owners. If you're a longtime listener of the show, this is something you've heard from us before. But 
I really do think that one of the marks of a mature trainer is that they are looking for things to simplify and they are looking for things to remove from the day's schedule so that they can really focus on the important Amen. elements. It, it is not the opposite of like, oh, how do I cram more stuff in here? That, that's the trap of the beginner who feels that they need to either impress with that, uh, you know, kind of back to back to back wave of stuff, or they're not as confident in their ability to really sink in and, and dig in to a, a specific thing for an extended period of time. Um, so yeah, on the other end of that, you know, trainers, this is, you're going to, you're going to hear this message from us again and again and again. The <laughs> real mark of the pro is who can simplify and really get a deep dive on something. You don't want to be, what's the saying? Uh, an inch deep and a mile wide. Mm. That's not going to help you in the long run. Mm -hmm. All right. I like it. This next one is about, you know, beach seasons coming up here. Got to get people looking sure good. Is. And this is from... Some would say it's already here, Pat. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it was late to arrive in Washington State, I'll tell you that much. Uh, this is from Arca Strength and Conditioning. I say they're very thankful for finding the podcast. Appreciate that. Um, oh, started listening to all of them two months ago, and finally, you just burned through them all. He's got all caught right. up. It's fantastic. I'm an old school CrossFitter, gym owner, and competitor, now a master's above oh, awesome. 40. And been doing CrossFit since 2011. Um, nice. Let's see here. I would like your input on this. My question is, me as a gym owner and coach, I hold quite high standards for how our members should perform and appear. I wish they would look more and perform better than average, especially the ones who have been coming for years. I would like them mm. to stand out wherever they are, mostly due to nutritional habits. I'm also a nutrition coach, and I always talk about nutrition and lead by example and offer nutrition services as well, but I, I may be scaring them. On the other side, my wife, who's also a coach, keeps telling me to basically calm down. Hey, it's great that they're consistent and they're showing up, so you must be doing something wrong, so maybe, you know, pump the brakes with trying to preach the nutrition stuff to them. Sorry for the long message, but I'm addicted to your podcast. What are your thoughts on that subject? So this been is been doing another, it a long uh, time, got consistent yeah. members, you know, that, you know, maybe their grace time is going down, you know, things are moving in the right direction, but, um, you know, maybe he just thinks that they could look a little better aesthetically. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, this is another one of those situations where you got to take the wins and you got to take stock of those and you can't lose sight of the progress that's being made. That's very important. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of of two minds of this. I really firmly believe that one of the fundamental jobs of a coach, trainer, affiliate owner is to believe in the people that are showing up more than they may believe in themselves. Yes. I think that's a big part of it is, hey, I know where the ceiling is for, for uh, the average person and you are going to undersell yourself by a long shot. Let me show you how close we can get to that if you take my advice, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the one hand. On the other hand, you can't punish people for not wanting the same things as you. And you can't start thinking less Since of them for when, that. Adrian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? You can't, you can't start having your opinion tainted of the efforts that they're putting in because they don't do it in exactly the way that you would want or that you would approach it. I'm not saying that you know, this is the case, but you got to watch that mindset because it can start to turn into that if you're not careful. So to me, it's really a balancing act between those two uh, viewpoints. It's like, yeah, I want the best for my, my people here. I want to take them further than, than they think they can. I know I have the tools to keep offering to them so that they can get there. Comma, on the other hand, I cannot expect that they're going to have my exact set of values. And that's okay sometimes. So how you navigate that is a little bit tricky. And, and maybe I kind of dodged the question with that Food answer. It is a tricky one. But, <laughs> yeah, I, but I, I think it's really you keep the door open. Yes. That's what I would say is like, hey, man, I don't expect you to come through the door, but it's always going to be open. And so, you know, after a certain point, hopefully we can get to the, uh, the state where that interest is peaked naturally and the person notices, oh, this door has been open the whole time. Maybe I will mm -hmm. take that first step or that next step. That's exactly the phrase that I was going to use, the open door policy. Nutrition is yep. one of those interesting topics that 
man, it's so mission critical to your health and fitness. I mean, my goodness, it is mission critical. But depending upon how it's presented or the individual you're trying to speak to, you can just shut somebody down and close them off and develop this really negative interaction about food because it's linked to so many other things in our society and our personality and it's emotional. And so there's a lot to unpack there for some people. And you might not know how much unpacking you need to do for any given person until you start doing it. So the open door policy, Mm -hmm. I think is, I think is huge. And maybe you have a chat about it every now and then if this gym owner is obviously passionate about it. So maybe once every two weeks, once a month, whatever, you could tell people, Hey, after the Saturday workout, we're going to stick around for an hour, you know, we'll throw some chicken on the grill, there'll be some veggies there, we're just going to have I'm just going to talk nutrition. You guys can have some delicious food and we're going to talk nutrition. And if you have questions, great. If not, ha- enjoy your weekend and and sprinkle in in something like that, that basically nutrition can be almost anything that you want, right? You can, you can mm-hmm. make it really hard and detailed and nuanced and what's going on at the cellular level. And there might be some people that that really appeals to, but you can also tell people, we don't have to nuke this. Like there can just yep. be some really small, so to speak, lifestyle changes that will have a really big and profound impact. You'll still enjoy delicious food. You'll still know what to do. And I can help you with that. Wherever you are in that spectrum, love to geek out or want it to be as minimally invasive as possible, I can help you. you And I'm here if you need me. So I would do something like that. Again, open door policy. And then, you know, I think I think this is an old glassman thing you can correct me if i'm wrong on this but i think you know because he, he'd get the question every now and then at a seminar and he was like yeah you know I, don't, I think he said something along the lines of look here's all you got to do you just got to like people are competitive you just got to you just got to get one person to try it <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> yeah exactly and that one yeah, person in right. like the competitive 5 a.m class or 6 a.m class whatever totally. that, that all of a sudden they start to lean out you kind of see in some abs that you never saw before and suddenly you know the shirt's off or whatnot and then it was like what's going on with bob or karen or whoever over there you know and then and then you know just it just starts to fester in there because people are competitive and someone's asking a question right. that you didn't have to broach it. So maybe you just need to, you know, maybe you don't need to convert the whole gym. You just need to get yes. a small handful that buy in because yep. it will work. Ripple. Because yep, it's for so sure. positive and impactful if they actually follow your sound nutrition prescription, they will look, perform, and feel better. And that's the best marketing you can get right there. Yeah, and I, I like reading between the lines. I think that's probably why this this trainer is so interested in that. Is like, hey, I want these people to be a, a product of of the work that they're putting in. I want them to be that walking business card. Like, I get that. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. Uh, scaling in terms of nutrition is a often overlooked concept. You know, it does not have to be a daunting proposal. It can mm. be a very simple. Here's the next viable step. In the same way that if I'm gonna uh, if I'm gonna take a new person from never deadlifting to deadlifting 405, I'm not gonna show them four wheels on each side and say, "Here's where you're gonna be in a year." You know, like some maybe you got a college athlete coming in and he's stoked on that, mm-hmm. but for the rest of us, we're gonna look at that and say, "Oh man, that's pretty aggressive." I don't know, um, but over time with incremental progress, you start with the barbell, you add some plates, you keep going. Sooner or later, that four plates on each side, you're like, oh yeah, that's normal. That's just what you do. We've mm-hmm. built up to this state. It's the same thing with the nutritional approach. You know, you can't show them the end state of, you know, hyper-focused on the details. No way. It just seems like a bridge too far. Um, and then, and then I think you're absolutely right with the competitive nature. And I would say it's even more powerful if you can find somebody in a group that isn't traditionally competitive. So for example, maybe you have like a a group class that is largely like working professionals and they're kind of not that, you know, Mm -hmm. they're there to get fitter or whatever. They're not like the hyper competitive former athlete crowd. Mm. But if you get one of them that starts to pull away from their little pack and that little niche training group, the rest of them are going to notice right away, oh, what's going on with Jerry? And they're going to want that too. So yeah. (laughs) use that to your advantage absolutely yep (laughs) 
All right, we've got two more if we can get through them. Let's see, we've got a good okay. pace. We got a good we pace got, going I think here. we got it. <laughs> okay, here we, we got go. it. This next one, it speaks to me, Adrian. Okay, here we go. I entitled this New Programmer with a Broken Heart. Oh, I saw this one. You, yes. you did send this one to me early. Okay, say, so, uh, this is from Todd M. Hey, Pat and Adrian, I'm a rookie programmer who kind of fell into my position because I'm passionate about it, but also our programmers stepped out of our affiliate. I've had a handful of complaints about programming. Most recently, a 10 by 250 meter row sprint in which no one showed for class. And the night before, I received complaints word of mouth through my coach. Uh, I know I'm on my way to figuring out what is good and what is needed for my athletes through various avenues, such as your podcast. So here's my question. Have you ever been so passionate about programming that when no one did your workout, it left you somewhat heartbroken? It really sucked when <laughs> no one showed up to class and I knew people yeah. weren't thrilled about it and the workout wasn't our usual strength plus Metcon class that everyone's used to. Just wondering if that's ever been the case or am I just too emotionally invested? No, I think that that makes perfect sense. I mean, if you care about something and you really thought it through and you just determined that this is the right course of action and, and everybody else feels differently, obviously, yeah, that's that's a tough pill to swallow sometimes. So no, I don't think that that's a... Don't shy away from feeling that because it just means that you care. You give a damn mm -hmm. and you should. So no, man, that's take that. And, and yeah, it sucks to feel that way, but the feeling itself is not the problem here. So um, that's number one. And yes, I've certainly felt that way in the past. <laughs> There's no question about that. And uh, I'll, you know, I I don't like to um, talk about this side of the house too much in this podcast, just because it's not the focus. But you know, with my role uh, with CrossFit and putting workouts out there, putting tests out there on a large stage, I have been privy, not privy, but subject to. Uh, a lot of feedback in a very public forum and some of it's enthusiastic and some of it's uh, a little bit more scathing. And yeah, it's, it doesn't feel good when somebody has uh, like really strong negative feelings about what you're doing. Um, but I digress. I think what's important to recognize here is that change is always going to be viewed skeptically when people know something is um, different than where they were in the past. So, for example, if they come in, they've been doing this program for a year and a half, two years, whatever, and they know this is kind of the routine. I show up, I do X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, it's got a totally different flavor. It could be the most well thought out thing in the world, and people are going to look at it a little bit side eyed because it's not what they're accustomed to. And it has nothing to do with how valid or good the thing was and everything to do with the fact that it's not what I did last month or last week. So you got to make sure that you're not falling into that and, and starting to get down on yourself due to just the natural nature of, of change. That being said, so you got to be aware of it and say, okay, look, if this is what people are used to, and this is where I want to go, and if there's a significant distance between those two things, the jump has to be manageable for people <laughs> to do it and get on board. And so there's got to be some str strategery on your part part, to um, take them stepwise until that end state that you think is better. And maybe that's you give a little bit on some things that maybe they're not your favorite thing to do or they're not the way that you would plan it uh, given you know free reign, but it'll help get people a little bit closer to your vision. And over time, they're like, oh, I get it. And now I've created a new culture around this program and everybody's bought in. Um, that's harder to do and it takes some maturity or whatever, but you got to give a little sometimes to get a little. I, yes, yes. I'm, I'm going to draw a couple lines in the sand here. Uh, it just <laughs> yes. takes good old hard stances. <laughs> <laughs> Over the line, Smokey. <laughs> so first uh, of all, you go into your question. Like, yeah, it, you're, yeah, it absolutely hurts if you, pour your heart and soul into trying to create what you think is beautiful, elegant, effective, intentional, well-designed, laid out programming. And it just, it doesn't resonate. I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's so you're, Oof, no, I'm right there yeah. with you. Um, at least I'm, you know, I, when I program anyway, it's not something that I just do casually. Like there's a lot of time and effort that mm -hmm. goes into it. And so 
if you just put so much time and effort into something and then people are like, wah, wah, wah. Oh, yeah, that would sting. So you're you're a normal human being. You're good to go. Yeah. Now here's the other part. You know, you said that you're a rookie programmer. You're passionate about it. That's fantastic. I would encourage you to continue pursuing that craft. It's not for everybody, but I, I think it's phenomenal. But whether you were a rookie programmer or soccer player, you're going to be a rookie for a really long time. Just it is what it is. And then you're going to be intermediate mm -hmm. for a really long time. Like it's just it takes what they say. It takes 10 years to become an overnight success. You've got to give yourself <laughs> time to actually get good at something, especially if what you're trying to do is relatively complicated. Okay? So that's your, your rookie. Hang in there. Keep doing it. Be open to feedback truly assess what's going on you know could you have done it better was there a, a mm -hmm. mistake here somewhere that's fine okay so number one you're on the right track number two this might be an unpopular opinion but i'm going to say it first of all it breaks my heart that nobody showed up to your workout that's that's ridiculous okay that's 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 cherry picking on a level that's profound no one showed up yeah um, agreed that's, that, that's strange Strange, whatever, show up, yeah. do the work. Number yeah. two, uh, now I don't know what you programmed the day before. I don't know what you programmed the day after. But I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you laid out a good week of programming. That workout, so all I know is that workout in isolation. 10, 250 meter rows, let me tell you, my friend, Todd M., who left this question, that's a phenomenal workout. That's a great workout. I'm giving it workout. two thumbs up. Yes, you also. get two enthusiastic thumbs up on that workout from yep. myself and Bosman, especially if I'm going to go ahead and be you know, gracious, that you put in a nice substantial rest period between each one of those intervals so that people could yep. go hard to the paint. That yep. is a workout that you don't need to do anything before that, and you don't need to do anything after that if you have properly executed 10, 250-meter rower efforts. Um, yeah, buddy. And I here's the I'll go for another line in the sand. Look, here's the deal. If I was, <laughs> in, I'm fired up. Sorry, I'm passionate about programming. No, do it. If I, I was, it. you know, in your local area, and I don't know where you're from, staying in a hotel, you know, maybe out with the family for a little vacation, and I peruse some local gyms websites. Okay, as you said, they're not, you know, they were used to the normal strength plus Metcon class. If I click on ones that have the strength plus Metcon class, I'm not dropping into those gyms. That's my personal thought on this. I see you. I'm like, ah, oh, what's going on at this gym? 10, 250 meter repeats with three minutes rest between each. I'm like, this guy gets it. I'm not saying I'm going to enjoy the workout because I know what that feels like, but I know you're on to something effective. You understand intensity. You understand recovery. You understand not over programming. There's a lot going on in that simple, what appears to be a simple workout, but it's still a very effective workout. I would drop into your affiliate. That's my just, that's my two cents yeah. right there. Well, uh, and hey, I I like your lines in the sand, Pat, and I think I'm I'm on that side <laughs> of the line. I think, but uh, I shouldn't say. But in addition to that, I'll also add that sometimes, and this is another lesson that I learn, you know, every season. Uh, helping out with CrossFit Games is that sometimes what is shown on paper doesn't tell the whole story and you have to get people there in terms of the concept. And so what I mean by that in this particular instance, you got 10 by 250, somebody that sees that and they don't have a lot of guidance, they're like, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. Great. Sure. Right. Um, yep. But if if on your coaching notes, you can craft this really cool application of it, where it's like, no, it's going to be great. We're going to have people come in. They're going to get in groups of two or three. We're going to run waves of this every 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. It's going to be these like hard start sprints. Everybody's going to get fired up. Like that's a cool story. And that's oh, yeah. a fun group workout. Um, and that has nothing to do with the workout itself and everything to do with the application of it. And that's another layer that you have to consider. And if you can get people there on that layer, sometimes they'll be a little bit more um, generous with what they're willing to, you know, show up and partake in. Absolutely. Uh, the why. Hey, you know, the why is important. Yeah. Why are we doing this? Well, and not even just the why, but like the how. How, how are yes, we going to execute this in a way that makes it super fun for everybody? Because I can see this as like a Friday afternoon 
throwdown where you've got a group of of people and you are just egging each other on and like i'm in pat's ear on his interval he's in my ear on my like you know what i mean it's gonna be great Mm -hmm. um but that's not necessarily reflected when you see it in a google doc somewhere that says 10 by 250 right so sometimes you got to lead people down the path a little bit so that they can see oh this is actually going to play out really cool and i'm not now here's my i'll do i'll cool my jets for a second now here's my uh, yeah. more uh you know my my, my more peacekeeping uh, thing i'm not <laughs> i'm not saying anything here that i have not been guilty of previously yeah. you know sure uh when i was new to crossfit and didn't understand functional moves and intensity and the methodology and the why behind it and i was just starting to play with it and dabble with it coming from a more is better mindset and all this stuff i would have looked at this workout not understood it, thought Ugh. it was maybe the warm up, and and be like, "What? That's all we're doing? Like, I'm not going to go to this gym. What the heck? No one's getting oh, fit at this man. place. I just didn't know what I didn't know, you know. And so, yeah. and and that might be the case potentially. I don't know. With you know, just because somebody shows up to the gym every day, maybe they're an accountant, an investment banker. They're not invested in figuring out the methodology. They just show up to get fit, to have fun with their friends, and they trust you to do that stuff. And so. Just because they've been coming to your gym for two or three years, it actually doesn't mean they really have a profound, nuanced, sophisticated sure. understanding yeah. of the methodology. And so even after three yep. years, they might see this workout and quote unquote, not get it. And so, yep. you I, know, a little conversation it, is helpful. I agree. This brings me back to my initial point, which I would bet the house that this is a change is bad type of assessment rather than a real deal. I don't like this program assessment. So mm-hmm. take that for what it's worth. And hopefully over time, people get accustomed to new style and, and new culture develops. So we've got one more question. You think Let's we can get through it. it? I think we can do it. Okay. All right. Here we go. This one could, I'm going to do my best not to make it, uh, not to make it uh, longer than it needs to be. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Okay. This is actually somebody from uh, my gym who posted this question. Um, in our private Facebook group, and I asked him, hey, you know, I'm like, hey, Boz and I are recording tomorrow. Do you mind if I broach this? He's like, love to hear what you guys have Ooh. to say. Green light. So this is from awesome. Jeremy D. And he says, um, help, help, me, help me talk through a family situation. Long story short, my in-laws, his wife's parents, came into town and took our two-year-old and four-year-old boys for a few nights to spend some time with them. At home, our family eats very clean with occasional treats. Let's just say my in-laws don't share the same affinity for healthy food and movement. (laughs) While we were away, uh, while they were away with the in-laws, our kids had their very first soda of their entire life. Uh, A lot of dinners of Domino's pizza and pasta and, and, you know, and more cookies than they could count. He says the soda in particular makes me upset since I had told them explicitly the day before that this was my line in the sand, the soda. Oh, we're back to it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I have ideas, but how would you approach this? I want to make sure I'm not overreacting. So it's cool he's reaching out like, I don't do I need to pump the brakes in this one. I want to make sure I'm not overreacting. I would love some input from others that have faced this kind of situation. Should I have a serious conversation and explain that they need to respect the rules for our children? Should I let it slide and see if this repeats? Uh, Since we're trying to do the right things at home and they'll see that, or should I just let it go and say grandparents spoil their kids? Man, uh, full disclosure, I don't have kids, so I can't. This is great. So this we got we got both sides. This is great here. Uh, This is going to depend so much on the relationship that you have with your in-laws. I mean, (laughs) if you want to continue to have a relationship, (laughs) right? Without knowing that, it's really hard to make a recommendation. Um, I would say that if you have a good relationship with them. And you want to keep that good relationship, just like we talked about with one of the earlier questions, you can't come in hard on this one because people's natural response when you come at them hot about something is not to say, oh, let me listen to what you have to say. Right. You're clearly, I'm you're so clearly open to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. uh, I will definitely amend my behavior based on <laughs> this approach. Mm-hmm. So uh, you got to know that. So I wouldn't come in hot about that. But I do think that if you have a line and you know that line and that line was violated, then you should let that be known. I think that boundary is totally reasonable. And I think, you know, okay, it's a it's a pizza and a movie night with cookies. 
and the soda is a bridge too far, fine, let that be known. Say, hey, you know, I love that you guys took the kids. I love that they had, uh, uh, you know, some, some fun times with you. I'm not so worried about, you know, the occasional treat now and again, but hey, this is just, I can't do the soda and here's why, you know, and then leave it at that. That's, that's what my approach would be. If I know the line, the line's been violated. Now it's just a clear cut discussion about a boundary that was already laid. And it's not a hot discussion about like, oh, you did everything wrong. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want you in charge of my children. It's nothing right. like that. It's, it's, hey, this was great. It was awesome. They got to spend time with you. This is one thing that I just can't, I just can't budge on. And I hope that you can respect that. You know, what's funny is that I haven't checked the comments since last night, but this was getting a lot of interaction back and forth, which is yeah. great. And, but as of last night, the overwhelming consensus from, from the comments was let it go. Yeah. Believe it or not. Now, I disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get why. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it, I disagree with that with some an asterisk or a caveat or whatnot, right? So you know, you know, if I had Jeremy here in front of me, I think one of the interesting things I would want to know is: is this the first offense, right? Like everyone gets a silver bullet, everyone pushes the boundaries, whether you're ten years old or seventy years old. You test the boundaries a little bit. Are these hard and fast rules, or you know, I did we have a little wiggle room? What's the strike zone like? Um, that being said, you know the. And somebody might be like, hey, relax. You know, that's grandparents are supposed to do that. It's just a you know, maybe it's just a can of soda. They had a couple sips or just the cookies or whatever. I'm actually not so concerned about the pizza and the cookies, to be honest with you. Um, the pizza and the cookies, yeah, it's it's the soda and it's it's the it's the fact that he says he explicitly said something. Yeah. Like, hey, we're and raising our we're raising our children this way. Yep. We, you know, even though you're the grandparents. They're not your kids. They're our mm -hmm. kids. You're doing us a wonderful favor. They love you. We love you. But here are just the rules for our kids. You can you can have a good time in this world without that. And so that's the one thing that I would feel some sort of need to broach it again in a diplomatic kind way of like, uh, I, I didn't come up with this rule for no, we might be raising our kids differently than you would. That's okay. But I just... I would like for you to respect this. And if I went to your house and you said, I don't know, maybe I wear shoes in my house and you don't wear shoes in your house, I might think your rule is silly, but I'm now in your home. I'm going exactly. to be respectful. I'll yep. kick my shoes off. And, you know, like it is what it is. I, I would respect that boundary that the other party had presented, whether it was one totally. I agreed with or disagree with, if I wanted to continue to have a harmonious, symbiotic, back and forth relationship. And I've had yep. interesting things happen with, are, you know, like six months ago, when my daughter was six months old, I remember somebody coming up to me, we were at a party, and they're like, hey, this is a serious question. They're like, do you mind, can I, does your daughter eat Doritos? Can I crunch up a couple of Doritos and, and give them to her? I was like, my six month old? No, you can't give her Doritos. Why in the world, <laughs> why in the world is this even a question which is asked? You know, like, there's some, there's some strange things that happen in society with food and with people. And some people are like, you know, hey, we're the happy fun, you know, we're the we're the fun crowd, and we get to break the rules a little bit, and it's an interesting slippery slope, especially with in laws, since they're not his parents, it's yeah. his wives, his wife's parents. So, but I would I would just feel some sort of need to broach it appropriately, since he said that he explicitly asked them not to do that. That's all, and I would obviously totally want agree. to main, I would want to maintain that relationship, have everyone walk away friends. Yep. And maybe they would both yep. budge a little bit, but I feel like it's going to just fester if he doesn't say something. At least maybe, maybe, totally. maybe I'm, I'm projecting myself. It would fester within me. Let me let me say that. It's probably a more fair no, way to I, say I it. Think, uh, I think that's totally fair. And then on the other end of that, I think that if you don't, again, if it's an established boundary, the boundary has been violated. I mean, it makes sense to bring that up and, and confront it. Uh, and if you don't, then that boundary is going to be continually not only violated, but you're gonna they're gonna push deeper and deeper into that boundary. That's that's a guarantee. And so, once you gain a little ground, yep. you gain a little more. Yep, exactly. It's and it's one of those things. That, like if I tell you, Pat, I won't wear a, a blue shirt, and then you get me a baby blue shirt, and I'm like, well, I'll wear that. I guess I'll wear that color. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, you're gonna keep sending me blue shirts, and it's it's you now know that my boundary is not real. And the next time I come to you and I say, you know what, Pat, I'm not going to wear green shirts. You're like, yeah, sure, buddy, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that boundary is not going to be taken seriously either. So yes. Yeah. I, I can't wait 
well, we covered so many great topics today, but that one in particular, Man. I think if people want to, they could leave some interesting <laughs> comments. So I, I hope, I, I hope so. <laughs> I know we were running out of time a little bit. I am glad that you, le you know, left the least nuanced question to the end there, Matt. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> we could we could have talked for a lot, lot more than that, uh, and everyone's different. But I that was yeah. fun. We will definitely do this again. We'll cover some good ground. Uh, as always, we thank everybody out there for their continued support. And like we say every week, we, you know, we read the comments. Obviously, the whole show today was based upon your comments. So find yep. this episode on the BTWB YouTube channel. Post your thoughts, your comments on any of these topics. How would you, you know, dive in if you were here having the discussion with us? You know what we think, but we want to know what you think. So once again, for Adrian Bosman, I'm Pat Sherwood, and we will see you next time.